sneeze. Good evening, those of you who are present in person and those of you who are watching us online. I would also like to greet you with uh, the greetings that we have at this time, which is a uh, blessed Sabbath day and a happy Sabbath day to all of you. I would like to begin with the words of Jesus that he spoke and we can find them in the Gospel of John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. With this, I would like to invite you to please stand, and we are going to sing hymn number 50, which is in the context of what I was just reading, Abide With Me, hymn number 50. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can be here in freedom, that we can worship you, and thank you so much for the Sabbath day, which reminds us of perfect redemption and uh, perfect creation. 
I am thankful for Jesus Christ, and I pray, Lord, that during this time and this weekend, we would truly, truly see the true picture of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be open, and that, that by our choice, giving them to you, that we can not just for a moment, but always abide with you, Lord. I pray that you would be with our speaker. Thank you for bringing him safely all the way from the West Coast. And I pray that he would be guided with your Holy Spirit, as well as all of us. I'm asking you this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Tonight we are beginning a uh, series of the study of the Adventist history. And there are going to be six presentations. We are beginning tonight, then tomorrow morning at 9.30, then 11. Uh, those of you who are going to be with us and who are planning to join us tomorrow, uh, please plan to be with us for a whole day. Uh, we are going to have fellowship lunch and then we will continue at 2 p.m. and then 3.30 p.m. in afternoon. Uh, the titles uh, you are going to hear, or you heard them before tonight, as you saw already, it is the liberty of conscience. Uh, it is my great privilege, and I'm so glad that uh, with us is Ron Duffield. Ron Duffield grew up in Northwest, worked as a respiratory therapist in Walla Walla for several years before attending Wimar College where he met his wife, Cherry, and spent nearly 15 years working in the New Start program and as a college libra librarian. In 2004, Ron and Cherry and their three daughters moved to Dixie, Washington, where Ron is currently works in the local hospital. He has authored two books, and I'm just going to show you those two books. And I would like to tell you that it is a must read for everybody to truly understand the Adventist history. Uh, the Return of the Ladder Rain, this is volume one. As far as I know, he's working on the volume two and soon he's going to be out also. This is a third edition of The Return of the Ladder Rain. This book is translated on 13 languages. Those of you, I know that sometimes we have people who speak Romanian. Is it on Spanish too? Spanish also, and Romanian language, and many other languages. The other book is also a must read, Wounded in the House of His Friend. When will the aborted Lada Rain resume? Uh, that is the subtitle in the question. So we are, uh, it is also interesting about uh, Ron that he is a fifth generation of the Seventh-day Adventists. And usually when it comes to the second, third, fourth, sometimes then become a nominal, but uh, just the moments that I spend with him in a car and knowing before, I see that he's on fire for the Lord. It is also interesting that his great-grandfather attended a well-known in Adventist history 1888 general conference. So he is uh, well-versed in the history and we are so glad that you are with us, and I'm sure that our, if our hearts are open, that we are going to be truly blessed. Thank you for being with us. Testing. There we go. All right. It is a privilege to be here tonight. And, uh, you know, every time I get ready for a seminar like this and travel the country, I'm amazed at how big the world is. And I've only traveled a few hours. But I, I, I recognize again, you know, that uh, there are millions and billions of people on this planet that still need to hear the gospel message. So... Tonight, I'm going to talk about a subject that I am not an expert on for 
probably 25 years I've studied on Adventist history, and I'm, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on that, but I'm more familiar. But only in the last few years has my interest peaked in regard to liberty of conscience, religious liberty. And the more I study, the more I realize I don't know or didn't know, which of course includes American history. Why did God raise up this country in the first place? And so some of what I'm sharing tonight uh, and through the weekend is based on things that I've you know, been reading on uh, more recently. And I, I basically, I guess I could summarize, and I'll mention this probably again, my idea was, oh yeah, liberty of conscience, that's um, religious liberty, uh, has to do with Sunday laws, and someday off in the future there's going to be Sunday laws, and then when they come, I know about them, so I'm going to be ready. And I'm finding out that that's not really true, and that I'm being in that position is a very dangerous position. And so I think the Lord, in his mercy, has actually given us history to help us avoid that mistake by looking even at our own history. So basically, weaved throughout this whole weekend, we're going to talk about this book, the Bible, which in essence is a, a history book. From the beginning to end, God uses history, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow as well for church. God uses history for the next generation to prepare them to not make the same mistakes and to, to gain the victories, the same victories in the next generation. And it's only by passing on that history and understanding that history that we avoid some of the mistakes that our forefathers have gone through. So I'm, we're going to talk about religious liberty. We're going to talk about uh, American history. We're going to talk about the message of righteousness by faith and l religious liberty, how they have woven together in the past. And my hope is that uh, this weekend, if anything, will generate a lot of questions in your mind as to where we're living today and the things that we see going around the world around us in this country and around the world. Has this happened before and can we learn from the past so that we know how to avoid the mistakes of the past and how to face the future? So, uh, Pastor mentioned a little bit, I, we, my wife and I spent about 15 years at Weimar and I'm sorry that she's not here and our three daughters, but uh, I'll show some pictures tomorrow. So. Um, uh, but not tonight. But during those 15 years I spent at Weimar, some of those in the library, that's when my interest really peaked on Adventist history, and I'm so thankful because it, it uh, really blessed me, saved my soul. And, uh, of course, when I first began to study, it wasn't with any intention on sharing that with anybody else. It was more just, it was such a blessing to me. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, liberty of conscience, and I'm going to go through seven just principal foundational ideas as we kind of chronologically build up to the beginning of the Advent movement in regard to liberty. And I know I'm preaching to the choir on many of these things, but I think it's kind of good to refresh our minds on these things. And the first one is that liberty of conscience, true liberty of conscience, uh, brings us to this issue of the great controversy. And at the very heart of the great controversy, uh, you'll find this issue with liberty. Now, Satan's kingdom, uh, he uses force and compelling and persecution for the purpose of trying to get people to trample on God's law. And that in itself brings us into bondage, real bondage. Whereas Christ's kingdom is built on liberty of conscience, freedom of choice, for the purpose that God wants to write his law on our hearts so that we will escape that bondage of sin and really experience true freedom. And this, of course, think about the issue, this issue with the Jewish nation and the discussions that Jesus had with the leaders of that nation at the time in regard to what true freedom was. Here's a statement in Great Controversy that kind of summarizes this. God never forces the will or the conscience, but Satan's constant resort to gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise 
seduce is compulsion by cruelty. And then notice, through fear or force, he endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. That's really what he wants, is homage to himself. To accomplish this, Satan works through both religious and secular authorities, moving them to the enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. And we're going to see this in another one of the principles we're going to look at, that Satan uses many different avenues and ways in which to get his uh, agenda forward. Now, here's another statement. This is a uh, kind of an, I, I like the way this summarizes liberty of conscience. Notice, liberty is the right to choose. Freedom, true freedom, is the result of the right choice. So you see that with liberty of conscience. It's, you know, God doesn't, he gives us liberty to choose, but we don't, it's not without results or, you know, in other words, if we choose to follow Satan in his way, obviously we're not going to experience true freedom. And that's what this is saying. Satan, on the other hand, you could summarize his work as censorship is the tool used when the lie loses its power. And you could put a different word in there for censorship. You could say cancel culture, persecution, uh, compulsion, force, any of those things Satan will use when his lies begin to lose their power. Number, the second principle, which I just mentioned uh, from the quote there in Great Controversy, is that Satan uses more than one mode to get his agenda through. And I want us to think about this. Um, We could probably spend the whole night talking about what's depicted in this picture here, Christ before Pilate. In that room, you had Sadducees and Pharisees and a civil government all coming together to persecute and ultimately kill Christ. And Satan used both Sadducee and Pharisee. And in fact, what's interesting uh, is when Jesus addressed the Pharisees and the Sadducees separately in their groups, he would address the sins, you know, of the Pharisees where they were going wrong when he was, uh, you know, in uh, discussion with the Sadducees, he would talk about the issues uh, with them as well. But when he warned his his disciples here in Matthew and several other verses in the Gospels about the leaven or the problem of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, he warned his disciples, avoid the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he didn't differentiate between the two groups. It was, they were all uh, suffering from the same leaven. In other words, at the end of the day, both groups, even though they were so diametrically opposed to one another, so far apart on every issue of life, actually were suffering from the same common factor. And it was proved by the fact that they could come together and agree upon one thing, and that was to kill their Messiah. And I want us to think about the implications of that today in our world the factions that we might see, is Satan using both factions to, for one end result? Is he attempting to do that in our own church? Do we see that sometimes taking place? Here's a statement of Desire of Ages that kind of summarizes this up. It says, the two sects, Pharisees and Sadducees, had been at bitter enmity. The Sadducees courted the favor of the ruling power. They were into big government in order to maintain their own position of authority. The Pharisees, on the other hand, fostered the popular hatred against the government, longing for the time when they could throw off the yoke of the conqueror, but Pharisees and Sadducees now united against Christ. So you notice how two groups had 
different views about the government, and yet in the end, they actually would join with the government to persecute Christ and his followers. And again, I would just say, I don't know how all these dots might apply to us today or what's going on in our country or going on in the world today, but I do believe that as we study the past and the present, we can see similarities that Satan often uses opposing factions to get the results he's working for. And our, the temptation for us is to look at through one eye only. I'm speaking of myself. Oh yeah, Sunday laws, that's coming through, the, through only the religious right. That's all I need to pay attention to. But is it possible that Satan is also working through other factions to destroy this country, to prepare it for the pendulum that goes back and forth? And we'll really see this more tomorrow morning for Sabbath school. Well, after Jesus was crucified, went to heaven, and his followers began to spread the gospel on this in the, in the, around the world, the pagan Rome, and for a time even joined by the Jewish nation, Jewish leaders, continued to persecute the Christians. Great Controversy says, the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire in which paganism was the prevailing religion. So here's Satan working through a religion, not a religion we would consider, you know, a normal, what we consider religion, but paganism was a religion. It is a religion. And Satan uses it to persecute Christ's followers. Well, pagan, as you know, pagan Rome went off the scene as Rome fell apart into its ten divisions. And papal Rome took its place. Did the persecution stop? It only, it continued. In fact, if not greater. And by the way, I would mention, because there's several, uh, both in uh, what I present tonight and tomorrow, some of the pioneers talking about the papacy. I want to be clear, I'm not talking about individual Christian people who are seeking the Lord, but I'm talking about a system that the Bible points out very clearly is a persecuting power. And I think we need to remember that very clearly, even today, in uh, times when I think we often forget, as a nation, why people came to this country in the first place. Signs of the Times... Again, notice this connection through paganism and then through the papacy, Satan exerted his power for many centuries in an effort to blot out from the earth God's faithful witnesses. Pagans and papists were actuated by the same dragon spirit. They differed only in that the papacy making a pretense of serving God was the more dangerous and cruel foe. And I've heard people estimate 50 million people, you know, died at the stake and other torturous events during those dark ages. But again, the point, the principle I'm suggesting here is that Satan uses more than just one way to push his agenda on this earth, and he always has. And it often shows up in what we might consider factions or extremes. But Satan is working with both. Now again, in the, the book Great Controversy, Ellen White makes this interesting comparison. She says there's a striking similarity between the Church of Rome, the papacy, and the Jewish church at the time of Christ's first advent. Now, she doesn't specifically say it here, but I believe that that takes into account the fact that the Jewish nation was fractioned, fr fractured by extreme left and right, Pharisee, Sadducee, and so forth. And I believe that would fall under as well that the papacy takes in both extremes 
In fact, only uh, four pages later, Ellen White, speaking to Protestants, makes this statement. A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and to shun it. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world. And then notice the two extremes. Those who would be saved by their merit and those who would be saved in their sins, here is the secret of its power. In other words, you can be a Pharisee or a Sadducee and you're accepted with that concept in your experience in this enormous religious structure um, that has had so much power in this world. It, we'll come back to this in a little bit, but notice this, the, the last line. Here's the secret of the power, and this takes in almost the entire world. Well, principle number three, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, Coming to, the, to realize that liberty of conscience is not just religious liberty with a narrow definition of Sunday law issues somewhere off in the future. Liberty of conscience is much broader than that, and even religious liberty regards so much more. And liberty of conscience includes civil liberties that our forefathers acknowledged and talked about and wrote about in the review concerns about freedom of speech and freedom of uh, uh, other civil areas, not just, they address more than just Sunday law issues. Here's a statement that I think sums this up from Signs of the Time. Those who first found an asylum on the shores of America rejoiced that they had reached a country free from the arrogant claims of popery and the tyranny of kingly rule. They determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. And I was surprised at how often this is talked about in, by our pioneers and by, in the spirit of prophecy. I was reading through, my wife and I were reading through um, Patriarchs and prophets, and I had never seen this, but when, when the children of Israel asked for a king, Samuel was seeking to protect them from the tyranny that would come from a kingly rule and limit their civil liberties. It, it, this is in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, and somehow I'd never seen even in the, uh, uh, the history of the Jews this principle written out in the spirit of prophecy. Here's another statement, great controversy. Republicanism and Protestantism, and by the way, I'll stop there. Republicanism is not talking about the Republican Party. It's talking about a republic, uh, the, the representation of, of the, the people. And Protestantism isn't talking just about a, um, you know, a religious group, but it's talking about the principles of religious liberty became the fundamental principles of the nation. These principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. Just a few moments ago, we read a statement about the secret of the papacy's power. Here's the secret of America's power and prosperity was standing on the principle of liberty of conscience. The oppressed and downtrodden throughout Christendom have turned to this land with interest and hope. Millions have sought its shores, and the United States has risen to a place among the most powerful nations of the earth. Now, I think it's only as we that, as, we as Seventh-day Adventists or as Christians realize that God raised up this country for a purpose that we really understand fully you know, the movements in history. And that is that God raised up the United States right at the right time so that a final message could go to the world, the three angels' messages. 
could go to the world from a foundation of liberty which was in place in the United States at that very time. Here's what some of the pioneers um, said in some of their writings about this. This is Loughborough. He said, where is a government to be found more lamb-like, referring to Revelation 13, in its appearance than this our nation, our own nation, with its Republican and Protestant rulers? And again, he's, not, he's, he's speaking not of a, a political party, but the, the principles. We shall then call the two horns of that lamb, like beast, Protestant, which is ecclesiastical power, and Republican or civil power. Here's Uriah Smith, same subject. One of these two lamb-like horns may therefore represent the great principles of civil liberty in this government and the other, the equally great principle of religious liberty, which men so highly prize and have so earnestly sought. I think as, you know, an American growing up in the United States and never having lived under some kind of a communist rule, for many in this country, we've forgotten what freedom really means and how precious it is. And anyone who, you know, themselves or they have uh, relatives who grew up under a different regime know what it means really to come to a country where they can experience freedom. Here's what Ellen White said on this topic. She said, we are engaged in an important and an essential work. We must carry on an aggressive warfare. We are to stand for true Protestant principles. And then notice what she says, for the policies of the papacy will edge their way into every place possible to proscribe or forbid liberty of conscience. And the context and what she's talking about, again, is not narrowly defined as Sunday issues only. It's that <clears throat> liberty of conscience applies very broadly and liberties can be taken away and we don't even recognize it if we're only looking at Sunday laws as that only fulfillment of um, losing our liberty. And in fact, I would submit to you that it's happening all around us, even as we speak, and we're not 100% awake to what's going on. Um, working in the medical field, there is, we're losing uh, liberty of science and freedom of speech. If you speak against a narrative that's the common narrative, you can lose your job just for speaking and suggesting. It's been that way over the issue of evolution and creation. If you want to publish an article, you know, supporting creation, best wishes to you to get it into any journal out there because there is a cancel culture in place in this country. And again, I say some of these things are going on and we're getting, we get used to them and we forget that many of these liberties not involving Sunday laws, were, should be protected under the Constitution. Well, during this very time of the uh, rising up of America, the second great awakening took place. Now, the first great awakening took place in the early 1700s. Uh, you would have had, uh, you know, great evangelists, um, Wesleys and so forth. The second great awakening began, and again, I believe God was behind this because America is just coming to, to rise in, uh, at the, in the late 1700s. And at, towards the end of this second great awakening, which involved both Europe and the United States, the great second Advent movement began. And that's really where Adventism then comes into the discussion not only tonight, but for the rest of the weekend. And God used not only William Miller, but he used many others in this country and also around the world to begin to proclaim the message of Jesus soon coming. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Notice this statement by Loughborough. He says, Elder William Miller had the names and addresses of 3,000 ministers in various parts of the globe who were proclaiming that 
first angel's message, the greater portion of these being in North America and Great Britain. I had no idea that there was, you know, I knew there was a few, but William Miller had addresses for 3,000 other ministers that God was raising up to proclaim this message. And I tell you, that gives me hope. This is in the days before internet, by the way. And God, without them ever communicating with each other, were all proclaiming the same message. And I believe the Lord can do that again. But there's something that happened in the summer of 1844 At first, the churches in America were very supportive and around the world as well of this message. They they may not have proclaimed it, but they at least supported it. But in the summer of 1844, opposition began to arise. Notice, but as ministers and religious leaders decided against the Advent doctrine and desired to suppress all agitation of the subject, they not only opposed it from the pulpit, but they denied their members the privilege of attending preaching upon the second advent or even of speaking of their hope in the social meetings of the church. And then notice, in the summer of 1844, about 50,000 withdrew from the churches. Now, <clears throat> you'll, you'll realize here a, bit, a little bit later what I'm getting at here, but summer of 1844, a change took place. And some didn't just leave on their own because they didn't have the freedom to speak about the second coming. Some were actually removed from their own churches. Ellen White and her whole family, or she was Ellen Harmon at the time, her entire family was kicked out of the Methodist church for believing and speaking about the second coming of Christ. Here's what Jan Andrews says about this later, looking back, 1851, looking back to the 1844 summer, he says, why are men of no other, for no other crime than that of looking for the coming of Jesus Christ expelled from the churches of those who profess to love his appearing? To these and many other questions of a similar character, we can only answer that the lamb is such only in pretension he is dragon in character. I find it interesting that, that uh, Andrews actually kind of applies this almost in a corporate sense to the, the United States. Speaking of the lamb of Revelation 13, who's speaking like a dragon because kicking out its members from its own churches in the summer of 1844. Well, this is the point that I want to bring to number four principal foundation of what we're going to look at this weekend, that there was a a moral decline in the churches, which led to a deeper moral decline in the country, which spiraled into factions, which led to what took place in the 1880s. Here's how Ellen White described this. She says, about this time, talking about 1844, a marked change was apparent in most of the churches throughout the United States. There had been for many years a gradual but steadily increasing conformity to worldly practices and customs and a corresponding decline in real spiritual life. So it wasn't solely the summer of 1844, but as the churches in Protestant America began to become more like the world, forget what their purpose was, there was a moral decline. But it was even greater in the year 1844, there was evidence of a sudden and marked declension in nearly all the churches of the land. While none seemed able to suggest the cause, the fact itself was widely noted and commented upon by both the press and the pulpit. Now, this is interesting to me because about a year ago, as I started studying into liberty and the the issues taking place in the mid-1800s, I began to, to see in the secular press of that day and even in the pioneers, some of the pioneers' writings, that there was this unexplainable moral decline in the country. And so I was trying to put my finger on that and I, I was looking up on, you know, 
different articles and so forth of this moral decline. And then just this a couple months ago, my wife and I are reading through Great Controversy. We get to chapter 22, I believe. I believe it is called A Warning Rejected, talking about 1844 summer. And Ellen White describes the very thing, the moral decline, which was recognized, but nobody seemed to put their finger on what had caused this. And yet the chapter clearly points it out. It's, it was the result of rejecting the warning given in 1844. She continues, she says, in refusing the warning of the first angel, they rejected the means which heaven had provided for their restoration, and they spurned the gracious messenger that would have corrected the evils which separated them from God, and with greater earnestness they turned to seek the friendship of the world. Here was the cause of that fearful condition of worldliness, backsliding, and spiritual death which existed in the churches in 1844. There it is, clearly defined what had happened in this country. A rejection in 1844 led to a spiritual decline in the churches, and the effect of that, obviously, would spill out into the community. So you see how this can go both ways. If the church becomes like the world, the church declines. And when the church declines, it has nothing to offer to the world as a remedy to the sin problem, and the world declines even more. And we'll see this even more so tomorrow when we look at the results of this. Now, here's just an example of one of the, as I was looking up, you know, what was going on in the 1840s and 50s that led up to the events of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Here's an article, uh, or a paper, actually it's a master's thesis written by someone in 2012, talking about wicked California during the 1840s to 60s. I wouldn't recommend it uh, as reading, other than perhaps research, because it's quite detailed, and I had no idea. I mean, the debauchery that was taking place in this country. And in fact, there's even a story she tells uh, in California there, there was a young man, he wanted to go to the entertainment Sunday evening there in the town with a bull and a bear fighting to the death where there'd be lots of, of gambling and, uh, and uh, you know, the bar there serving, you know, drinks and all kinds of, they were usually attached to a brothel and so you had this whole, you know, uh, scene which is very common in our day in some places of the country. But this young man felt a little uh, guilty conscience, and so he thought, well, before I go to the entertainment tonight, I'll go to church and, and partake in mass and you know, be blessed, I guess, and then uh, have my conscience cleared, and I will go to the entertainment tonight. And so he did so, and upon uh, going to that entertainment that night, he met none other than the very priest that he had received mass from earlier that day, participating in the very events of the, that evening. And he says, obviously puzzled at this, it was a strange metamorphosis he had undergone since the morning. Only four hours had elapsed since I saw him officiating at the altar and feasting upon a substance which he believed to be the actual flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, I think there's a lot of consternation among the, wor the world, worldly, when they see that the church is not rising to where it should be. When, as a church, whatever church it is, participates in the very sins that we might condemn in the world. Well, notice what Uriah Smith talks about when he talks about the declining moral condition in America. And again, we talked about how 1844 didn't begin there, but largely there was a decline in the churches and it began to affect the whole country. And this is what Uriah Smith says in his book, Marvel of Nations, which I would recommend. It's actually being republished, uh, written originally in 1876. Uriah Smith says, the people of the United States are not all saints. 
The masses, notwithstanding all our gospel light and gospel privileges, are still in a position for Satan to suddenly fire their hearts with the basest of impulses. This nation, as we have seen, is to exist to the coming of Christ. And the Bible very fully sets forth the moral condition of the people in the last days that immediately precede that event. Iniquity is to abound, and the love of many is to wax cold. And then Uriah Smith goes on to quote probably a dozen texts that describe the moral condition at the time of Christ's second coming. And then he says this, and there are elements already in existence which furnish a luxuriant soil for a baleful crop of future evil. In other words, he can see that already in America there was things going on that was about to be poured out on this country. Our nation has grown so rapidly in wealth that it stands today as the richest nation in the world. Wealth leads to luxury, luxury to corruption, and corruption to the breaking down of all moral barriers. And then the way is open for the worst passion to come to the front and for the worst principles to rule. And then he closes with this, which was shocking to me. He says, in addition to this, we have spiritualism, infidelity, socialism, free love, the trade unions, or labor against capital, communism, all assiduously spreading their principles among the masses. And these are the very principles that worked among the people as the exciting cause just prior to the terrible French Revolution of 1789 to 1800. Human nature is the same in all ages, and like causes will surely produce like effects. French Revolution, I wish we had time to go into that, but as you remember, it was two extreme factions. Humanism rebelling against persecu you know, persecuting religious side, and the French Revolution came out of that. And Uriah Smith is saying, we see the same things happening in the United States, 1800s, where you have these extremes, including socialism, trade unions and labor, and communism spreading their principles. And I would just ask, do we see any of that happening today in the United States? Is there any of that kind of those forces playing out right now in the United States? And I would say yes, those forces are actively uh, at work today. And again, to go back, if we're only looking for Sunday laws off there in the future from one side, are we going to miss the fact that Satan is actively at work laying the foundation from another angle, just waiting for a pendulum to swing. It happened back in the 1800s, which as we go along, especially tomorrow morning, we will see. And that's the whole purpose of going through this, is to show that what is about to happen to us today has happened before. And were they, was Adventism ready then in 1888, when God brought the remedy, both religious liberty and righteousness by faith, the Laodicean remedies, to the church with the purpose of taking that message to the world, were we ready? Here's James White talking on this same subject. Infidelity, he says, in various forms, especially in name of spiritualism, has spread over the Christian world with fearful rapidity while the dark record of crime has been blackening. So again, you know, we know spiritualism started, you know, almost uh, at least officially, right, back in the 1840s. And, and where is it today? I mean, it's just everywhere. Hollywood is steeped in it in, in so many ways. Now think about this. I'm going to touch a little bit more about this tomorrow, but think about 1850s. Moral decline in this country, 
And in 1852, that's the first time Ellen White talks about Laodicean condition coming in to the Advent believers. And it, it gives me a little better understanding, understanding what was going on in the country at that time to realize as a church, it's, unless we are careful, the, tr- the, the world around us can definitely affect our spiritual condition. So this is what she says, 1852. She says, many who profess to be looking for the speedy coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world and seek more earnestly the applause of those around them than the approbation of God. They are cold and formal like the nominal church that they but a short time since separated from. The words addressed to the Laodicean church describe the present condition perfectly. So 1852 was the first time Ellen White, instead of applying that Laodicean message to the you know, nominal churches, they begin to see that it was applying to us as a people, 1852. And it wasn't just Ellen White, it was many, uh, James White and others began to print articles in the review starting in 1852. But again, the point I'm trying to make here is that as the world declines, it, it has a greater force in tempting us in our spiritual walk to decline as well. Well, when uh, the church declines morally, And the world declines as a result and continues to affect each other. Is is it going to affect uh, other areas of the country, including politics? And I would say um, yes, and this would be principle number five that I'm talking about uh, tonight. And that is, there is corruption in both or all political parties. It's not just one side that Satan may be using to push his agenda. And I find this throughout the Advent Pioneer's writings, that I think they were very clear on this. Um, Political corruption, said Uriah Smith, is preparing the way for deeper sin. It pervades all parties. Look at the dishonest means resorted to obtain office, the bribery, the deceptions, the ballot stuffing. I don't think it's anything new. Politics hasn't changed uh, to today. And the point, the reason I bring this up is I, I feel like there is a temptation for us today, again, to side, you know, political parties and not realize that Satan is using both to push each other farther and farther, just like he did the Pharisees and the Sadducees, so that the, in the end he can bring about his, his design. Here's what um, R.F. Cottrell said. Again, I cannot vote for a bad man, for that is against my principles, and under the present corrupt and corrupting, sta- corrupting state of politics, I could not wish to elevate a good man to office, for it would ruin him. Now, I, I do want to make it clear, even though I don't have time to go into this, that you know the, the pioneers did vote for issues and for a particular party on an issue, but they, I think they were, they were very careful not to get involved in a political party, thinking that's, that's going to solve all the, the country's problems at all. And this is what Ellen White says. Several places she says there is danger, decided danger, for all who shall link themselves up with the political parties of the world. There is fraud on both sides. God has not laid upon any of our people the burden of linking up with either party. We are under Christ's banner, and everyone who names the name of Christ is to depart from iniquity. Here's another place she says, But what kind of spirit takes hold upon our people when those who believe we are now under the third angel's message, the last message of mercy to the world, brothers in the same faith, appear wearing the badge of opposing political parties, proclaiming opposite sentiments and declaring their divided opinions. And that's the point. It's not that there aren't real issues out there and there's a right and wrong to those issues. It's that a political party is not going to solve what's going on in this country or in the world. And we've been given a much higher calling, and that is the calling of sharing the last message 
of mercy to the world. But here's what I want to, to make clear here in this next article by Uriah Smith. That didn't mean that the church was neutral when it came to issues that they could talk about. And I find this in the review um, where Uriah Smith addressed issues even though they claimed new, neutrality against either political party. He says, when we declare our neutrality in politics and refuse to take part in a contest so exciting as the one which is now agitating this nation, it is right that we give an exposition of the principles on which we stand and the reason for our course. Now, he, he's writing this in 1856, and what he's talking about is the issue that was setting up the Civil War, secession from, you know, the states wanting to separate and connected with that, the whole slavery issue. So Uriah Smith is saying, yes, even though we're neutral on politics, I'm going to give an explanation of where we stand on these issues. And I think that's, there's a lesson here for us. Then he says, the unrighteous course of the border ruffians and the pro-slavery demagogues, sustained as they are by modern Democrats in general, must create some feelings in the breasts of those who have formerly engaged actively in these contests. Though they now feel compelled to confine themselves to the question of paramount importance to this age of the world. In other words, there were Adventists, early Adventists, who were part of the abolitionist groups, you know. They were still against slavery, but their mission now was proclaiming the Advent message, not in a political, you know, abolitionist group that may not even necessarily be Christian in nature. And so this is what Uriah Smith is talking about. And we feel it our duty to confine our efforts to preparing ourselves, number one, and others as far as in us lies for the great and final issue already pressing upon us, the revelation of the Son of Man from heaven, the destruction of all earthly governments and the establishment of the glorious universal and eternal kingdom. In other words, and this is, by the way, is just the tip of the iceberg of articles I've run across where Adventist pioneers are talking about the issues, but staying away from getting caught up in the political issues of the day, the political parties of the day, and speaking to the issues, making it clear um, we stand for moral and, and good principles, and we stand against immoral principles, but we don't join either party to try to, to uh, prove that. Principle number six that I want to speak about to this evening is, again, this idea that uh, liberty of conscience is so much broader than just religious liberty and Sunday laws only. It involves many other issues, including freedom of speech. And uh, you will find articles scattered through um, the review from this era, 1850s, 60s, speaking about freedom of speech. In other words, it, it wasn't politically, they weren't getting politically involved to stand up and say, what the government is doing right now is not right, nor in accordance with our Constitution. This is speaking like a dragon. George Washington, if freedom of speech is taken away, then dumb and silent, we may be led like sheep to the slaughter. Here's an article in the review that was actually quoting from another magazine. It says, freedom of speech. On the Thursday last, in Prince William County, Virginia, John Underwood was found guilty for of, notice, uttering and maintaining that owners have no right of property in their slaves. So even to speak in Virginia at this time against slavery was enough to get yourself a fine. No freedom even to express uh, concern or a difference of opinion. This should never have been. And my question would be, what's happening today where people can't speak without um, 
losing their job or in some cases um, receiving, you know, punitive um, charges against them. Here's Loughborough, again, on this issue of freedom of speech. He says, there has been a mad rushing forward of the friends of slavery holding spurious elections, choosing a bogus legislature who form for themselves a constitution that declares, notice, death to a man who takes a slave out of the territory, five years imprisonment to a man who gives a slave information that causes him to leave Kansas, so this is all coming from Kansas State, and two years imprisonment to the man that simply expresses his opinion in Kansas that it is wrong to hold slaves. So again, here's in the review many examples <clears throat> where the pioneers, not just on this subject of slavery, but our church took a stand against um, this encroachment to freedom of speech. Now here's an article in the review that's actually talking about um, Garibaldi, who was an Italian trying to you know, bring Italy together and also bring them out from under the, the papal control. And so the review uh, printed this article, a news article about that. It says, whether Garibaldi succeeds or suffers defeat, his attempt to free Rome and add to the kingdom of Italy can hardly fail to attract the attention of Christendom to the present condition of the papal states. And then notice the whole list he goes through. Both the form and the spirit of government are despotic there. It has no liberal feature, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, free schools, free pulpits, liberty of worship, liberty of action, liberty of trade are utterly unknown in the territorial domain of the Pope. The power of the priesthood is unlimited. The people have no rights which the church is bound to respect. Popular elections have not been introduced nor any of the safeguards of personal freedom. Laws are made and taxes imposed without the consent and advice of the people. So here's, uh, like I mentioned earlier, here's an article in the review, which, again, is talking about other issues of liberty in even other countries where people are not enjoying these liberties, and they're taking a stand, pointing out that these liberties are being encroached upon even in the country in the 1850s and 60s. And my question, again, is, is any of that happening in the world or in our country today that we're not talking about because we're only focused on one thing? And so we don't give a voice to actual persecution in some settings because we're only focused on one thing. And my question is, if we don't speak now, who's, what guarantee do we have that we will later? At what point will we speak out or stand up? And I'm not talking about you know, starting a riot or, or you know, something like that. I'm just talking about, have we taken a stand? Are we writing about these things? Are we warning our church to, to recognize what's happening around us? Is it only the right side of the political aisle that's going to bring persecution? Or is our country being destroyed by actions of the left as well that's setting up issues that are still coming down the pike? So the last, uh, the last one that I want to mention tonight, just a couple one here, here that I did mention before, and that is that my idea, again, of Revelation 13 was that the United States was a lamb-like beast, and someday in the future when they pass Sunday laws, then it would speak like a dragon. And I realize, as I've read through uh, articles again by the pioneers, that speaking like a dragon is not just applied to the Sunday law issue. It was applied to many other things, including, again, the slavery issue at that time. This is what... Ellen White said in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, she says, The two-horned beast appears in two phases, with the gentleness of the lamb and the fierceness of the dragon. This has, to some extent, already been shown in the inconsistency 
of sending forth to the world the doctrine of the equality of all men in respect to the natural rights, the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So she's talking about the Constitution. And yet, upholding by law all the evils of American slavery. Here's another one from uh, another article in the review. We have been accused of not quoting this law, talking, talking about the fugitive slave law, correctly. We have therefore taken pains to procure the law and copy out the part that we make use of to show the dragon voice from the dragon mouth of the two-horned beast, showing how it makes us all slave catchers under a penalty of $1,000 fine or six months imprisonment. Again, the lamb-like beast speaks like a dragon in more areas than just Sunday laws. You know, when I, working in a hospital setting, <clears throat> one time I happened to look up on the, um, a, a medical site in a position of authority in this country and on that site, it even gave you, it gave you a 800 number you could call if you heard someone else talking negatively about the topic under discussion. That's the United States. Turn in your neighbor if they don't agree with this particular agenda. So what I'm saying is the United States is already, has already, and is sometimes speaking like a dragon already in some of the actions and some of the things that are taking place in this country even as we speak. Here's Loughborough, just one or more slide here. This lamb-like appearing government, we shall show, speaks like a dragon in more points than one. Instead of carrying out his lamb-like profession, he speaks as a dragon. Yes, that very national executive body who have before them this declaration of independence and profess to be carrying out its principles can pass laws by which 3,500,000 slaves can be held in bondage. That's speaking like a dragon. It was then and it would be today. Last slide here. America was the hope of the earth due to right principles of Protestantism and republicanism. And again, this is not talking about the party. But at this last hour of Earth's history, America was forsaking these great principles. Protestantism was mimicking Catholicism, and republicanism was dissolving into an oppressive totalitarianism. A slave minority and an Adventist minority testified to that. This is how uh, the writer of this book kind of summarized this era in America. So again tonight, I've gone over seven principles, kind of the foundation that I want to build this weekend on, and tomorrow I want to start more specifically with our Advent history and how some of these principles we talked about uh, actually you know, show up in that history. So we're gonna talk, there's gonna be more stories tomorrow. In the morning, we're gonna talk about kind of how this moral decline and the issues going on right after 1844 built into the movements of the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, which set the stage for 1888 and national Sunday laws coming before Congress. For church service, I want to talk about how God was preparing us as a people for that very time with a message of righteousness by faith. A lot of stories for church service. In the afternoon, I wanna talk about the Minneapolis Conference where religious liberty and righteousness by faith came together with God's purpose of pouring out the latter rain on a people to prepare them to take a message to the world and then uh, the three o'clock meeting, I want to talk about how when that message of liberty came to Battle Creek and the initial response, and then it ended in revival, by the way, which is good news. Sunday morning, I want to talk about some of the revivals that came in this country, but then some of the snags, and ultimately the question being, 
is why are we still here and what can we do to prepare so we don't, as we go through similar things today, uh, how can we learn from our past? Both our country's past and our church's past. As Ellen White said, we have nothing to fear for the future unless we forget his teachings and the way he's led us. So let's stand as we close tonight. Father, I know we've gone through lots of quotes and, and history all thrown together, but I pray, Lord, dear Holy Spirit, would speak to us that as we think about the principles of liberty and even the movements in this country from years ago, we would recognize that some of these very things are again happening today, Lord, and that you have a plan for us. You want to use us, but you want to teach us from the history of the past. Lord, I pray that you'll be with every person here, every person that's watching. Lord, that you will fulfill your promise in our own lives, first and foremost. And then, Lord, use us to be a blessing to our neighbors and coworkers and friends to make a difference on this earth, Lord, to prepare for your soon coming. And we thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us uh, and uh, looking forward to see you tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning, Central Time. 9.30 Central Time. Have a good night and uh, God's blessings. <laughs>